if you'll turn there. I want to read two verses tonight. We're actually going to kind of do an on-the-fly uh, running commentary in this passage in a little bit. And so we'll get through every single verse in the chapter, which is 14 verses. But for sake of time, when you find it, right in the middle of your Bible should be Psalms or Proverbs. If you're already all the way in Proverbs, just turn back a little bit to the psalm, and it's Psalm 27. And this is David. This is David specifically uh, talking about the Lord and giving us, I guess, a little bit of an insight into why God said about him that he was a man after God's own heart. It really, uh, really shows us in this passage of Scripture what he knows about a relationship with God. And it's real for David. And I want to uh, look at it this evening, and I'll give you some, some background or some reasons why what we're do, for what we're doing in just a minute. But let's go ahead and begin. And we'll read the first, the last verse. We'll pray. And then we'll go to an entirely different passage of Scripture, and then we'll bounce right back to where we are and move forward from there. You ready? Verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Father, I pray that You would help us to be able to say, God, from a true heart, what Your servant David said about You. Help us to know You in this way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was in Bible college about a hundred years ago, uh, we had every semester, we had a ministerial seminar, and honestly probably was one of the most practical, helpful hours, uh, in, in the, a couple of hours during a week of the ministry. Now, I, I actually went to a good Bible college where they taught the Bible, and they taught you how to understand the Bible and just really taught the Scripture and uh, made, you, made you study, actually. You didn't just go there and they slap you on the back and give you a diploma and say he's a good old boy. They actually made you study and uh, pass uh, courses and so forth. And it, I, I got a lot of valuable uh, Bible college training. It was a big help. One of the things I enjoyed and uh, got a lot of help out of was ministerial seminar. It was uh, two, uh, I think it was two days a week uh, after chapel period where we would meet all the guys that were in ministry majors, and they would have in guest pastors from just all over the world that would come in and teach you practical things that they learned in the ministry, and it was that was a real help. I mean, guys that have been in the ministry, have been seasoned, the Lord was using, and they'd come in and say, I learned this, and show us some truths, some things that had helped them. And then at that time, uh, Dr. Jim Shetler was pastor of the church and uh, of the campus church and uh, he also would teach one day a week of the ministerial seminar and he just teach you a lot of practical things you know uh, <laughs> what's a pastor do how do you do it uh, how do you deal with people what do you, how to do how to counsel people how to help people how to preach so that's a lot of just uh, practical things and a lot of specific things as well and I enjoyed that a lot and then each semester we would have a chapter of the scripture that was fitting for guys that were studying for the ministry to memorize. And I remember my senior year, I believe it was, that Psalm 27 was our passage of the scripture. Uh, passing ministerial class was very simple. You kept a notebook, you wrote down notes of, of every teacher, uh, every person that taught, you wrote all your notes down, and, and if they gave you a handout, you included that as well. And then you typed your notes, and you you submitted your ministerial notebook to, so that they made sure that you paid attention in ministerial class. And then the other thing that you did for a grade in that class was that you memorized the passage of Scripture and you had to quote it perfectly at the end of the semester. And anybody could do that, actually. It was, a, it was, the one, it was only worth a credit a semester, the class was, even though it took two days a week. And then also you had to uh, be involved with ministries on the weekend as part of the class as well. But uh, one of the passages of Scripture, I, of course, with a lot of the passages would be out of like First and Second Timothy, uh, naturally, because it's really letters to pastors. Uh, but 
one of the passages, one of the semesters, was Psalm chapter 27. And actually, Psalm 27 dealt a lot with uh, kind of two, or I'm sorry, Psalm, not 20, Psalm 27, but a lot of the teaching that semester dealt a lot with uh, really teaching men about longevity in the ministry. Uh, you know, it's really tragic, but guys just don't make it in the ministry. They just, they, they fizzle out or they, they can't stick. They go to a place and, man, they don't get along with people in the church. And instead of figuring out how to work things out with people, they, you know, get into spats with people and it's you or me and, and somebody's got to go and either the church disappears and then the pastor leaves or the church runs off the pastor and he leaves and it's just a lot of tension in the ministry because of that. Man, that's not like Jesus at all. That's not the way uh, it's supposed to be. But I, I hate to say it, but when you have people that aren't spirit-filled, they don't act spirit-filled a lot of times and they have problems in the ministry. So that's one of the things. Uh, it's really tragic, but they. I remember when I was in uh, college, Bible college, in our ministerial class, I want to say there were about 400 men or so, maybe a little bit more than that, but around 400 men that were that were preparing for the ministry. And uh, they would tell us, they'd say, you know, probably 75% of you men will never be full-time in the ministry. You'll just never make it full-time in the ministry. And that's really pretty tragic, actually, if you think about it. You know, like three-fourths of guys not actually, you know, really uh, being permanently involved in the ministry. And that's not saying they're not going to go to church and serve the Lord and that sort of thing. But you're training to serve the Lord full-time in ministry. And so you kind of hope uh, that guy, more guys would make it. Do we need more churches, Bible preaching churches? Do we need more pastors? Yeah, we do. We need more, not less. And so it always bothers you when you say, you know, some guys won't make it. Uh, so a lot of guys just, you know, just don't make it. And one of the reasons guys don't make it too in the ministry is the same time reason a lot of people don't make it in their marriages and in life. That's because they can't handle stress. They can't handle circumstances. In other words, they're overwhelmed by the circumstances of life. Uh, it has become almost fashionable today, uh, and, 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 I'm, and let me tread lightly here as I say this. I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a bone to pick with anybody. I'm not, don't have a beef or an argument. But it's become almost fashionable for people to have mental problems and emotional issues. It's almost fashionable today. It's almost as uh, seriously. It's almost as though it is a trend. It's and it's like, man, you know, you are wonderful for sharing that you really don't have it together uh, as spiritually and emotionally. You know, you just can't hand you can't handle life. And uh, and I haven't said anything about this in a long time, but it's a problem and a lot of people are just medicated to deal with life. There's just a lot of people that are just they're medicated to just be able to function in life. That is without the help of a medicine or a medication. They just they can't they can't handle. We have, we have an unprecedented amount of disorders, don't we? Um, now, I understand that the fall and the curse being what it is, things are getting worse and not better. That's a reality. But I just wonder if it's a new thing. If stress is like a, a lately occurring thing, like, you know, life, this is like the first, oh, I don't know, century or uh, first... Uh, decade or uh, the, the, the first hundred years that people have had stress in life. You know, maybe like before we were born, like, you know, it just wasn't harder. Listen, I hear things all the time about how hard stress is, how, how stressful life is. And actually, some of it I can relate to. Let, let me tell you something I read a couple of months ago about stress. I read that the average teenage girl of, uh, that, that is 15 years old, receives and sends more than 500 texts a day. 500 texts a day. You know how many texts it takes to tick me off? I mean, does a text ever happen when you're not trying to do something? You know? Like, and again, I'm not anti-texter. Like some years ago, okay, when the, when the whole texting thing first got started, um, when, when they started texting, you know, it's still flip phone time, you know, you know, where you go beep, 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 get your, you know, your letter. When that first started, I thought, what's the deal with the text? 
Why does somebody send something in a text? I mean, what's the difference between, first of all, a text and an email? Well, it's just digital. At least a text is more secure. But what's the difference between a text and an email? It's, to me, it's just a, you know, it's a message sent digitally, right? Why can't you just call and say, hey, man? You know, and I realize that the, the uh, rudeness of a text is, is uh, a good thing. You know, you don't have to say hello and goodbye. You can just say, man, can you do that? And, and it's not rude to just send a terse text. I do enjoy that part of it, to be honest with you. You know, somebody will ask me a big, long question, I'll say no. Or they'll ask me a big, long question, I'll say sure. You know, I'm, I'm a one-word text. You know, I'm that guy. You know, if you text me. <laughs> so, uh, my poor mother, that's all I can say. You know, hello, Ryan, I love you, dear son. da 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 How are you doing? Good. <laughs> uh, but what I'm saying is this. If the average teenage girl takes 500 texts, and I don't know if they're all the same people, if they're the five people. You know, I have read teenage girl texts before. By the way, if you're a teenage girl, I will confiscate your cell phone, read your text out loud in youth group uh, sometimes. So it will happen. I'm not kidding about that. But uh, I have read teenage girl texts before. It's like this. What's up? Not much. What you doing? Not much. What you doing? Uh, hanging out. LOL. Oh, Okay. Uh, yeah, like you know, it's like, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and and yeah, now that now the emoji thing, which I don't yeah. relate to, is, is that's we're not talking about. And what I'm saying is this: 500 texts in a day is a full day's work. Like for me to send to fire off 500 texts, that's a stressful. I mean, that's a lot of. That's just that's stressful. Okay. So throw your stupid cell phone away. You don't have to deal with it. You know? <laughs> you know? uh, but so, so do we have some things that are an aggravation or irritation that some people have never had before? The answer is yes. But, you know, running to the well and getting water probably was stressful. You know, having to run to the outhouse maybe stressed people out back in the day. I don't know. You know, figuring out, okay, we don't use toilet paper, so we got magazines or we got corn cobs. What's the, you know, whatever. You know, there's stress in different eras, different ages. You know, like, like it's stress. Is, but like, can I, could I just, could I just argue with you for a second that things being sometimes difficult in life or stressful or uh, causing pain and emotional uh, things that you have to deal with and and all. Can I, can I just say it's not new? Like, it's just, it's not something that's come lately. And yet, when I was preparing for the ministry, you'd have guys come in and talk about how not to have a nervous breakdown in the ministry, or how not to, you know, uh, you know burn all your bridges, or how not to, whatever. And, you know, you start thinking, man, these people got some serious problems, you know, when you, when you uh, are thinking about the ministry. And then, man, I'll tell you what, you graduate and you're in ministry for a couple of years, and you realize, man, a lot of guys aren't making it. Yeah, I mean, you hear about the guy just, he just broke down. Yeah, I didn't even know how else to say it. I mean, he just, something just went wrong with him mentally or emotionally, and, and people are just having real problems. I don't know what it is to walk in the shoes of any other person. Okay, I, I understand nobody's alike. And you don't know what it is to walk in my shoes either, to be fair. right? So there isn't a band-aid that fits every problem. That isn't, that isn't what I'm saying this evening. But what I'm saying is, is that there's a God who's always been on the throne. He's still there. And I believe with all my heart that a relationship with the Lord that's real will take care of any problem that you have or it will put it in such a perspective that you can deal with anything life throws at you. Loss, sicknesses, devastation, pain, hurt. I'm just telling you that if you have a relationship with the Lord that's like what David talked about, my friend, there's just nothing that can come at you in life that in the perspective of your standing with your Savior and how much God loves you and how much you love your God that anything else will not just pale in comparison of importance with. I'm not trying to diminish or say that anybody's problems 
are small or uh, diminutive or unimportant. But I will say to you, in the perspective of eternity, in the perspective of how big your God is, and how much He can do, and how He can provide and care for you, yeah, they actually are. Actually, life is not really so bad. It actually isn't complicated at all. It actually, uh, the things that are such a big deal to us, we get all fired up on a daily basis, don't really matter much in the whole scheme of things in comparison with your relationship with your Savior. Now, I want to read a passage of Scripture where, I just in my personal study, I've never heard anyone else preach this from there, so maybe I've come up with some kind of you know, unique heresy that's uh, really grand. So let me share it with you just in case it'll help you the same way. Well, will you go with me very quickly to uh, the Gospel of John? And let's go to chapter uh, 4. John chapter 4. And uh, this is the uh, Gospel account of Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman. And uh, the woman, the woman we call her the woman at the well, right? The woman who had five husbands. And uh, if you look at the Gospels, when Jesus, for instance, in Matthew 10, when Matthew records how Jesus sent out the disciples by twos to preach the Gospel in every city, He said, don't go to the villages of Samaria, and don't go to the Gentiles, but only go to the lost house of Israel. Jesus was the King of the Jews, and He came as the King of the Jews. He came to die for the sins of the world so that the Gentiles and the other nations can be saved. But Jesus didn't go to Samaria to have a ministry there. Jesus was passing through Samaria and He was physically exhausted and fatigued so much so that He sat down out in the well outside of town, outside the village, and He sat there while His disciples went into the city to get something to eat. So literally Jesus... you know. His disciples traveled with Him, and I'm sure they walked the same distances, but they didn't do what Jesus did. First of all, they didn't have the load of coming to die for the sins of the world on their shoulders. If you think your problem's stressful, how about shouldering the problems of every person who's ever been born? Put that on Jesus. That's what He had on a daily basis. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Every waking minute with the Lord Jesus Christ was either spent in prayer or serving serving people. Literally, everywhere Jesus went, He would try to leave, and He would go leave a village and people, multitudes would throng and flock after Him. Even when He left people, His disciples came with Him. On a few occasions, He'd send them and say, go to the other side of the lake, and I'll cross over, and I can feel it. I can feel like, man, Jesus just needed a second. He was in a physical body without sin, but He had a body of flesh, and I'm telling you, it was a burden. Nobody dealt with anything that Je like Jesus did. Matter of fact, Hebrews puts it this way. You know this verse, don't you? We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore go boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, so does Jesus, first of all, have the ability to relate to anything in the world that you're going through? You say, well, Pastor, you're not going through what I'm going through. Jesus did. Okay, so don't give me that. I'm not telling you to do something because pastor can do it. I'm telling you to do something because Jesus can do it. And Jesus can help you. and He can give you the grace to help you when you need it. Okay, so the notion that anyone is alone and responsible for their own outcome is, is not only unscriptural, but it entirely throws and casts aside the ability of our Savior to help and to give you the grace that you need. So here's Jesus bearing the loads. I'm just, I'm just painting a picture for you. He's bearing the loads... Uh, of, of coming to die for the sins of the world. And he has a responsibility on earth. And his ministry wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy ministry the Lord Jesus had. And it didn't end easily either. Sitting outside the well of Samaria, he's too fatigued to go on. The disciples are going to go into town and get him something. He, he has this encounter with the Samaritan woman. She comes out and he said, Would you draw water for me to drink? And she said, How are you? You're a Jew, man. How's a Jew, you being a Jew, how could you ask water from me as Samaritans? Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. You know why. I don't get in the background or history of that. But that was the reality of it. Jesus, of course, was surprised her. And he said, you knew who it was that was asking. You'd ask me and I'd give you, I'd give you uh, water that would make it so you'd never thirst again. And she said, hey, man, give me you know, the, the water that you're talking about. And 
She said, sir, I, I think you, you're a prophet. There's something spiritual about you. There, you, you know God or something like that. And uh, he, he, he told her, uh, well, go get your husband, bring him out here. And she said, well, I, I don't have a husband. He said, yeah, you said right. You've had five husbands. The man you're living with isn't your husband. I wasn't picking on her. He was telling her the way it was. And she uh, said, you know, you, you are a prophet. And then she wanted to have a religious debate with him. She said, you know, you're a Jew, and the Jews say that we're supposed to worship God in Jerusalem in the temple. And uh, our people, the Samaritans, we believe you can just worship God out here in the mountains. God made the mountains in the high place. We can just worship God. He's, he's a spirit, so we can worship out here. And Jesus said, God's a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And He said, you know, God said to worship at Jerusalem. That's the truth. And so, yeah, that may be true, but you're... There, but he said, there's going to come a time when you're not going to worship at the temple in Jerusalem or out here on the mountain in a high place. And we know what that time was that Jesus was talking about. Meanwhile, the woman hears from Jesus, and she goes back into the village, and she said, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Okay, while, they're, while she's back in town telling them that, we get to our passage of Scripture that I want to read uh, tonight in John chapter 4, and look down to verse, I think it's uh, 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said his disciples one to another, Has any man brought him out to eat? Okay, so they get back. They went to get him some food because he was hungry, right? They come back and give him the food, and they said, Here, eat. And he said, Not hungry. I have meat to eat that you know not. And they said, Did somebody bring him food while we were gone? And Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye. And he goes on to give us the passage of Scripture where we talk about the fields being white unto harvest. And he talks about, I sent you to reap that wherein you bestowed no labor. Okay, now, here's what Jesus is simply saying to his disciples. He was hungry... They went to get him food. He was there to rest, but actually he didn't rest. He did what he always did. He ministered to the woman at the well while they were gone. She left and went back to get more people to tell him about Jesus, and he's about to have to preach to the whole village. And the disciples come back while she's gone. If you, by the way, if you think preaching is easy, just try it for for. <laughs> Just try it one time, actually. I mean, not get up and give a motivational speech and talk, but I mean pray and ask God for the power of His Holy Spirit. Ask Him to use you, and then get in the Word of God, and then get something that you can give people, and just see what it takes. The, the, the studying, that's not a problem. But the physical act of standing up and preaching, you'd be amazed. I could swing a pickaxe all day easier than I could preach for an hour, and that's a fact. It's just there, there's, a, there's a, a burden of the Holy Spirit on the preacher and it's not an easy thing. And so literally that's what Jesus is doing all the time is He's, he's endeavoring to be filled with the Holy Spirit and, and preaching the gospel of His kingdom. And the disciples go into town and Jesus hasn't had a break. They come back and they said, time to eat, Jesus. And He said, not hungry anymore. So they give Him something. And Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. He said there's sustenance in serving God. He said doing the will of God feeds my flesh. I'm not talking about, you know, it feeds the lust of the flesh, but doing the will of God meets my physical needs. I'm not the Holy Spirit of God. I do not give the conviction that the Holy Spirit will give you. But my friend, if your flesh is fatigued, it isn't because you serve God too much. You hear me? I hear people all the time say, Pastor, I burned out. You're burning me out. Man, we just working us too hard in the ministry. You know, you want us to preach here and go there and do this and do that. And it's just tiring me out. I just can't handle it anymore. My question is, serving Jesus burns you out? It ought to fill you up. It ought to fire you up. I remember old Jack Hiles. I'm not a fan of Jack Hiles, by the way. As a matter of fact, I don't like Jack Hiles. never did. I still don't. Uh, but having said that, sorry for the Jack Hiles people. 
that I'm offended, but there's a lot of reasons why you shouldn't like the guy either. But he used to preach a, a message on duty. Everybody thought it was the greatest thing in the world. And they'd say, when you don't feel like it, just do right. Duty. Duty. Why do you do it? Duty. Now, I don't do right just because it's my duty. I do right because I need to. This is good for me. I tell you, one of the things that gets me feeling good better than anything else is just doing what I'm supposed to. <laughs> I very rarely ever feel like going soul winning. That's a fact. I go all the time. But before I go, I don't usually feel like going. But I'll tell you, while I'm doing it, while I'm out knocking on doors and trying to tell people about Jesus, it's great. <laughs> and after I go, I say, man, that was awesome. I feel great. I feel like going after I'm gone. Because why? Because there's sustenance in serving Jesus. Do you know sometimes on a Saturday, I don't feel like preaching all day on Sunday. I just think, man, i got to preach five times tomorrow. I don't feel like doing that. I feel like speaking five times tomorrow. I said, yeah, I feel like it. But man, when I get to preach on Sunday, boy, I feel like preaching some more. After Sunday night, I feel like having, you know, a round two. You know, at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock or something like that. We're going to do that in uh, August of this year. But the reality of it is is that, you know, that's just the way you feel. You know, you just feel, man, it's just something about really getting what God has and getting fed spiritually satisfies you. I've, met, I've eaten meals where I'm full, but I've never ate a meal that satisfied me. You hear me? I've eaten meals where I'm full, but I've never eaten a meal where I'm satisfied. You say, Pastor, that's because you eat too much. Well, I like to eat. I do. I can go I can go 30 days and not eat. I can just cut it off and not eat for 30 days. I need to do that here sometime pretty soon. <laughs> Actually, I can do that just fine. But I can go and eat all day too. But no matter how much I eat, there's going to come a time when I'll need to eat again. I'll never say, well, that's enough. But you know, I can finish a day and I can just be literally overwhelmed by the goodness of God. And you know, I never feel like quitting when I feel like that. I never feel like doing serving the Lord's too much. I feel like, you know, we could do a little bit more. Uh, we could serve God just a little bit better. And we could, and I want to. And let's add a ministry. Let's do something else. Let's... Let's serve the Lord Jesus. If God gives us something, let's do it. Because there's sustenance in serving Jesus. One of the ways for you to avoid overstressing and one of the ways for you to avoid burnout in your life, my friend, is to make sure that your life is lived for the Lord Jesus Christ. When I hear Brother So-and-so burned out in the ministry, I just think, what in the ministry burned him out? God didn't do that to him. God didn't do that to him. And you can say, well, pastor, you're judging people. No, I'm not going to judge God. That's what it is. I'm not going to let you judge God. You tell me that God burns people out and abuses people. I don't believe you because I know God. I know what He's like. That's a lie. God will sustain you. God will help you. And that doesn't mean you have to meet my standard. It doesn't mean ministry for you is what I say it is. It's what God says it is. God doesn't burn somebody out. God doesn't overstress someone. God doesn't make it so that you don't love Him anymore and you don't love people and you don't love the ministry. God doesn't do that to anybody. we got overstressed Christians and they think God's the problem and He isn't. You see, that's the very problem is that God isn't, isn't involved enough in your life. He isn't important enough in your life. And he doesn't fit. And so then adding Him on top of all the burdens you've added to yourself instead of casting your burdens on the Lord Jesus... I will overstress you. Let's go to Psalm chapter 27. And I want to look at David's perspective of God. Now, what do we call David? What did God call David? What's his label? We don't call him the adulterer and murderer, you know, the adulterer and murderer guy, right? Do we? We don't call him the polygamist, do we? Was he those things? He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He was a polygamist. Uh, we don't call it. There's a lot of things you call David, you know. But what do we call David? A man after God's own heart. Man after God's own heart. Now it's an amazing God that an adulterer and murderer and polygamist uh, could be called by God a man after God's own heart. Isn't it? I mean, that, that doesn't make David amazing. That makes God amazing. And God's mercy, God's forgiveness, His long-suffering, it's, it's wonderful. But you know the, the impressive thing about David? When I look at David, I, 
I, I dislike him as a father. I dislike him as a husband. Uh, I dislike him as a leader in many instances. You say he was a great leader. No, he's a mighty man. Probably the, the most valiant man who ever lived. Probably the toughest dude that has ever lived on earth was King David. That's a fact. I mean, I would, if it were 100 guys versus David, I'd take David every time. I'd say, yeah, I'll take David over you. Anytime. Man, he, got, he went up against 100 a lot of times, and David came out and they didn't. So I'd take David over there. What, David wasn't tough. He wasn't a lot of things. But he wasn't adulterant, murdering polygamist who was a pathetic father. He was. That's the truth about David. But God said he was a man after his own heart. And as I look at the life of David and I ask, why would God say that about him? There are some things that I see about David and they're absolutely wonderful. And there are things that I want to emulate. Now, I'm not going to teach a class on parenting and use David for a good example. I'm not going to teach a class on um, how, to, how to treat your wife and use David for a good example. I'm not going to teach a class on leadership. Well, David's got some good examples of leadership. I like what he did when his men sneaked into the well of Bethlehem and got him a drink of water. And when he came back, he poured it out. He said, I can't drink you know, your blood. You, you guys made a sacrifice that I'm not worth. I think that was good leadership when he did that. But it was kind of bad leadership when he killed Uriah. I just, that's just bad leadership. That's not the right kind of thing to do. It's bad leadership when the kings go out to war for him to stay home. He was healthy enough to have, commit adultery. He was healthy enough to go to battle. And so, you know, he should have been, he should have been out at that time. When you look at the end of David's life, one of the things that sets him apart from people whose heart turned away from God, like, for instance, his son Solomon, is that David ended well. He actually ended well. He finished his life and he, was, he had a good relationship with God at the end of his life. It wasn't a, nevertheless, you know, he set up the high places and went whoring after other gods. Nevertheless, you know, he loved strange women and they turned his heart away from God. Not David. It was David. He loved God. That's how he ended. He, he did this, but he got right. He did this, but he, but he repented. He did this, but he repented. He grieved his heart. So he cared about spiritual things. And so David's really a great example because all of us can relate to failure very easily. But David succeeded in something I want to relate to, and that is having a relationship with the Lord Jesus that was unparalleled by anyone else. That's why he's the psalmist writing these sweet psalms about the Lord, about the relationship with the Lord. And he said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The perspective of that, he said, whom shall I fear? Listen, you want to know why I'm not afraid of nothing and nobody? I'll tell you why. It's because the Lord's my light and my salvation. Now, who's going to scare me? Who's going to put darkness in my life? He said, the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, if I have God's strength, what weakness of mine am I going to fear? You remember what David said when he was a lad about Goliath? That little dude? <laughs> he didn't say it that way. He's defying the armies of the, of the Lord of hosts? Is he nuts? That guy's crazy. He thinks he can defy the armies of the living God. <laughs> I'll take him. Why did he say that? Because David was a big, strong man? He said that because he knew the Lord. And he said, anybody thinks he can take on the Lord's nuts. Give me my sling. I can get him. So I'll say, take this, take this, take this. David said, Phew. I'm get him. God's going to deliver you into my hand this day. That was over quick, wasn't it? David had that attitude his whole life. He's like, who do you think you are? Like, really? You think, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord's the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? Who in the world? Who in the world can do anything when I know the Lord? Hey, anything God wants to let them do, that's okay with me. But I'm going to tell you something. Nobody can do anything unless the Lord lets them, and that's good enough for me. It's David. He said uh, in verse 2, he said, When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, he said, they stumbled and fell. He said, I was standing there. They came to get me, and they fell down. Couldn't make it to me. Couldn't touch me. He said, Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. 
though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Now, how many Christians just don't live with any concern about evil that could happen to them? You, you say it's you, I dare you burn your insurance policy. I'll tell you something. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not against insurance. I, I guess I'm against insurance, kind of. But I'm not saying I'm against insurance. But man, I'll tell you something. Uh, people don't trust God to take care of anything. I mean, we got to insure everything. Just cause, because, I mean, it, something bad's going to get us. Something's going to happen. It's as though we got something to lose. You know? Something's, <laughs> you could take my what? You better not take my Volkswagen, man. I'll cry. You know what? Like, seriously, what do, you, you know, what do I have to lose? Anything I have to lose, I can't. Anything that matters, I can't lose. Seriously. Anything I have that matters is eternal. So, you know, I mean, you're required to have insurance for some things. Uh, but, you know, Christians over-insure, and I'll tell you why you over-insure. Some of y'all just, you're gamblers, you're just taking a bet. You're hoping something bad's going to happen, you're going to win on the insurance. But the rest of y'all are just scared to death. What? You don't have life insurance? What's going to happen? I'll die and not care. That's what will happen. <laughs> My wife will care. That's why she's got life insurance on me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you got life insurance on me, baby? Something's going to kill me. You know they're going to. All right. <laughs> you know, but seriously, Christian, we want to insure our health. Man, you don't have health insurance? You don't have health insurance? What's going to happen if you get sick? I'll tell you two things. Two, two options. I'll either get better or I'll get worse. Or I'll get worse and die. That's almost three things, but the worse is kind of the same because I'm going to die anyway if the Lord tarries. Just, you know, something's going to get me, statistically speaking. Just look around, see what happens to everybody else over the course of 100 years. And just about, I mean, by the time 100 years has, ticked, has clicked off, statistically speaking, I probably won't make it, to, you know, just according to statistics. And I can have the best health insurance in the world, and I still won't make it. You can die with health insurance. You can die without health insurance. I get her done either way. I say I'm against health insurance, but sometimes Christians overinsure. Uh, you say, Pastor, but don't you know something terrible could happen? Da, da, da. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I got. I couldn't help you with that. But and I'm not. Again, what I'm saying is I'm not preaching against health insurance. Now I'm preaching about confidence in something other than God. And David's point here is that I'm not going to lose. If a host is encamped against me, if I'm in one of the caves in Engedi, and I'm sleeping in there, and there are you know 700 of Saul's army trying to kill me, Saul's army is going to be awake because they're scared of me, but I'm going to sleep because I'm not scared of them. Hey, listen, David was anointed to be king of Israel. He knew what that was. He went back, yeah, he said, when it's God's time. But he was anointed to be king of Israel. He wasn't king of Israel yet. He kind of knew he had some future to him. God's going to anoint him to be king of Israel. And Saul's going to take me out. <laughs> God said, I get to be king. Don't worry about Saul, what he can do. Listen, my friend, you may not have some kind of a promise that you're going to get to be someplace or see someplace. It may be just a promise that you're going to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. But that's not such a terrible thing. And the notion that you need to have problems sleeping at night because of things that you're concerned about or things that you don't have or things that are problems. My friend, that just tells me when we do that that we don't have the right kind of relationship with the Lord. See, David said, if you know the Lord, who are you going to be afraid of? If you know the Lord, you're going to be confident. And then he said, if, if a host encamps against me, he said, though a war rise against me, and this will I be confident. In what? In verse 5. He said, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. He said, God will protect me. See, in the pavilion. So God puts you in a pavilion and holds you. Now, doing things in perspective, there are places of protection, right? Uh, you know, there are... You know, you could you could grab a bear cub, right? If it gets far enough away from its mom, if its mama, you could grab a bear cub. But if its mama's around, I don't care who you are, what you are, even a duck. Sometimes just mess with ducklings and just see what mama duck will do. You ever done that? Mm. You ever just messed with? You say, Pastor, you sound like a mean guy. No, I'm not a mean guy. I like ducks. I've played with them before. 
uh, you'll be in a parking lot and there's a mama duck and she's got 10 ducklings and you step between her and her ducklings and all of a sudden she starts going, hey, you know, don't get between me and my ducklings. And then you separate the ducklings. You start walking some this way. And she'll run over here and go get those. And then you walk some over this way. And she'll run over here and get those. And you can get them further and further apart. And after a while, she'll be like, don't punk with my ducklings. And she'll come after you. <laughs> and a duck can take most of y'all out. A turkey definitely could. But a duck can take most of you out. I mean, they're, you know, you don't mess with them. God's a lot bigger than a mama duck. David said, God will put me in his pavilion or he'll set me on a rock. Kind of like, okay, David, put you right there and I'll deal with these people. In other words, God's your protector. If God loves you and if God doesn't want evil to happen to you, is there anything that could happen to you that God sees as evil? If evil happens to you, if God allows it, my friend, it'll be good. God will work it for your good. He's a good God. And David said, a host can encamp against me, war can rise against me. And he said, I'll tell you something that I'm confident about. In the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. In other words, if I get problems that are too big for me to handle, God will handle them. You know, some Christians won't let God handle anything. I have, in a couple of occasions, upon a couple of occasions in my life, had circumstances that I realized that were just beyond my ability to control. I try to control everything. I do. I, I, you couldn't probably call me a control freak. I'm not, like, ridiculous about it. But I'm a pretty confident guy. And I usually come up with solutions for things. You come up with a problem, and I'll just usually come up with a solution. But I've had some things that I'm like, whoa, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and I don't have a solution for this one. And I've had to just say, okay. Now, why in the world would I in my life have a problem that I don't have a solution for? And I think, you know, probably God wants me to just let him handle this thing. And I've said, God, you can handle this thing. You know what I've found out? There's no problem God doesn't have a solution for. He can just handle things. I can tell you about testimonies of things in my life that were too big. They were problems that were too insurmountable and they would have literally halted or changed the tra trajectory of my life and yet God just dealt with them. Did the impossible. And you know God does the impossible on a continual basis. That's the kind of God He is. And David knew that about the Lord. And how did he know that about the Lord? Because he had a relationship with the Lord. David didn't read in his journal sometime, and then at the right time he recollected it. David fellowshiped with God. And he knew God on a continual basis, and he knew God so well that it literally was second nature for him to say, God's going to get you. I know Him. I know what He'll do. You know, some of us, we don't know what God thinks. Well, I don't, I'm don't. i done hearing from God. I don't know what God... I don't know what God's... Yeah, you don't have a close relationship with God. You're not in fellowship with God. You're not walking with God. My friend, God is a real God. And He is a person who wants to relate to you and have a relationship with you. And you ought to spend time with Him. And if you spend time with the Lord, you'll get to know the kind of character He has, the kind of nature He has, and all of a sudden, you'll quit worrying about stuff because you'll realize God can handle anything. And He wants to. And He will. And He said in verse 6, Now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in His tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me, also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. When the last time it is uh, that we've had people who had an experience or had a life that said, I just want to seek God's face. I just want to know God. I just want to see God. I want Him to be real to me. I want, to, I want to, to have a relationship with Him. I want to have time with Him. I want to have Him talk to me. I want to fellowship with Him. <coughs> we're so into so many things, but we're not into just time with God. On a practical level, there's not some kind of cardinal rule 
or law about give God this percentage of your day. But on a practical level, if God is important to you, if your relationship with God has value and worth to you, on a practical level, it ought to actually take up a good bit of your priority. It ought to have a good bit of your life. In other words, there ought to be time that you spend with God, seeking His face. He said, when you said to me, seek my face, I said, my heart said, thy face alone will I seek. God, you want me to you want me to look for you? Yes. I want to. Of course, David had a man after God's own heart because he wanted God. He longed for a relationship with God. You ever feel dried up? You ever feel dead? You ever feel as though God is distant to you? Why is that? Is it because you spent so much time with him you got bored? Or is it because you spent no time with him, and he became distant. And thou saidest unto me, Seek my face. My heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Yes, I will. I want a relationship with you. I want to know you. My friend, isn't it ridiculous that somebody like God would want a relationship with someone like me and that I would scorn to deign to give him my time. It was God say, hey, Ryan Price, I want to spend time with you. I want to get to know you. I want you to know me. And I'd say, well, God, that sounds good, but uh, maybe, maybe sometime. Uh, you know, I'd like that, I think. Uh, uh, I'm really busy. It's incredible, actually, isn't it? That in a sense, God is seeking us. And we act as though it's bothersome to us to give Him the thought and to seek Him. And then David begs to God. He said, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. Verse 9, he said, Hide not thy face far from me. Put it not thy servant away in anger. But God, please talked about, first of all, God's protection, verses 1 through 5, verses 6 through 8 are really about His response to God. Because of who you are, God, I'm going to worship you, I'm going to praise you. And now He pleads to God, Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not. God, you've always helped me. I need you to keep on helping me. Don't forsake me. Don't leave. I, God, I, it's not, there's never enough. I need more of you. When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. There's no biblical record of David's father and mother forsaking him. And so I believe that what David is saying is a hypothetical, but here he's saying, I don't need anything but God. He's not saying I don't care about my mom and my dad, but he's saying my mom and dad, if they forsook me, the Lord the Lord make up for that. He'll take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Now teach, teach me how to live. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. And then he comes to his conclusion about God. He said, I'd never made it without God. He said, I'd fainted unless I'd believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And here's his counsel. He speaks, he goes from speaking from a testimonial basis to now giving advice. The way I see it when I look at this passage of Scripture, the way I phrase it in my mind, this is not inspired, but this is just the way I'd phrase it. I'd say, David, how'd you do it? How do you have a relationship with God like that? How does it get so real and so personal? And how do you see God's hand? I mean, is it evident? Was it evident to everybody that God was with David? Was there any question about that? Not at all. David, how'd you do that? And he said... Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And be of good courage. And He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. What? What? God, are you there? Uh, I could... Uh, God, i got some things uh, you say to ask according to your will. 
you hear us? Here's what I need. Da, 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 da. Okay, I'll see what you do. Got we got a lot of problems. Uh, I need to make a decision today. I got I'm going to make a decision today whether I should stay or I should move or uh, whether I should try for this job or not try for this job. I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and apply for it. And if if I get hired, I'm going to take that as you know a yes from you. And if I don't get hired, I'm going to take that as a maybe from you. And uh, if and I'll try again and see if I can get that job. And so let me know if you want me to have it or not. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. Well, God, uh, I've been really busy lately. I've got a lot of things going on. Uh, you know, I, you know, I'm taking these classes and I'm working this job. I'm in this relationship. And I'm thinking about buying this. And if I do that, then I'm going to have to probably take another job. And uh, you know, I, I also, and, and God, I just want to know. I just want to. I just want to know what you think about everything I'm doing right now if you just give me a sign otherwise I'll just take it as a sign that you like what I'm doing wait on the Lord wait on the Lord friend we don't wait on anything actually do we unless you're Taco Bell <laughs> we don't wait on anything actually we really don't I mean man I'll tell you y'all don't wait on me and you yeah, Pastor, you know, I need to know by this time if you want to do this or not. Oh, you know, you let me know in time. Or, you know, I'm not saying you have to wait on me. I'm not God. But, you know, we're just not very patient people, are we? You know, if you can help. Or whatever. Well, I just went ahead and got help. I just went ahead. We just go ahead all the time, don't we, in life? Instead of just staying in a place where we know what God wants, doing what we know God wants, and and just saying, well, God, I know, I know you wanted me here. I know this is what you wanted me to do. These are, these are my boundaries, my parameters for right now. Just, God, I don't want to be here forever. Are you gonna, you gotta move me. I'm thinking about going over here. Maybe I should go. No, we just, we just don't want to wait, do we? You know what the word wait means? You know what it means? Remain where you are. Stop. Don't take action. Don't just move ahead. There was a predecessor to David who was rejected as king of Israel because he couldn't wait. Or Samuel, he's supposed to come off for sacrifice. I got to get this battle going on. I know God wants me to fight this battle. I better get moving. Where is he at? Does he not know that we've got you know a schedule? Yeah, if he's not going to show up, somebody's got to do something, I'll do it. They offered a sacrifice. Wouldn't have the right to do that. Who was Samuel representing? God. If Samuel was late, was that Saul's problem? Samuel's supposed to be here. He's not here. Well, if he represents God and you don't in this in this aspect, this respect. You're God's king, he's God's priest. Right? If God's priest isn't there, then God's king needs to wait. That's the way it was. Samuel got there, didn't he? He did show up. And you know, that's probably a big difference between those two men. Saul and David. Saul said, if God's not going to do something, I better. And David said, if God's not going to do something, then you better forget it. Because it ain't worth doing and it's not happening anyway. We get a lot of things done. If we waited more, we'd probably know whether or not it was God doing it. I'm not saying that's true in every instance. But you know the whole idea of waiting on the Lord? If you say, Pastor, I don't understand that, then that tells, that tells you, that tells me, you don't understand it. You don't understand what it means to wait on the Lord. You don't know how to wait on the Lord. And if you don't know how to wait on the Lord, you don't know what David's talking about when he said, The Lord is my strength, the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my, uh, what is it, my confidence. Whom shall I fear? I think I twisted him. 
mixed them back. We should I be afraid? And you know the reason he knew that is because he knew how to wait on the Lord. Think of it. When David was anointed king of Israel, what was his uh, age? He was a boy. Shepherd. Now, did God ever use a boy to be king? Sometimes. When David became king of Israel, he was a man. That boy had been through some things. He'd been anointed to be a king when he was a child. He became king long after, and he'd been through a lot of things. Matter of fact, many times, David, it looked like he wouldn't survive to be king. Many occasions, David had the opportunity to subvert the current king and put himself in that position. Instance after instance, he could have taken Saul's life. Could have done it just about any time he ever wanted to. Why didn't he? Because what he knew about God. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. David lived to be one of the oldest kings and longest reigning kings Israel ever had. And he actually served Israel in his entire life even when he wasn't king. How did he get such longevity? Because he started early? A lot of guys started early and didn't live too long. How did David get longevity? <clears throat> See, I think when he, the Holy Spirit of God used him to pen Psalm 27, I think he had unlocked something. When you ask the question, when he gives the advice, I mean, he tells you about, here's the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Here's what I, 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 I. And then in the end, he says, you. You want to get something from God? You want to get something? You want to learn something I know about God? Have a relationship with God? You want to have the ability to say, the Lord is my confidence. The Lord is the strength of my life. This is my relationship with the Lord. You want to internalize and personalize that? I'll tell you how. Wait on the Lord. Friend, I'm not creating a religious exercise for you, but I want to give you some things you can try for a project. Try shutting up sometime. I can say shut up because I'm a pastor. Right, it's appropriate. The kids can't say it. Right, but try, try just being quiet sometime. Try stopping your mouth and your thoughts and just waiting... Two minutes. Try two minutes. You could try for an hour if you'd like and let me know how it goes. But just try and say, God, I'm going to be still for a minute. I'm just going to be still. I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm not going to ask you anything. I'm not going to uh, promise and commit. And you know, you'll sit there and you'll start sitting there and just say, I'm just waiting, Lord. I'm just waiting. You know, I'm wondering what you're going to do while I'm waiting. I'm wondering if you're going to, and we start telling God all kinds of things. We can't shut up. We can't stop our minds and our thoughts from just blah, 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 blah. Small wonder God can't get a word in edgewise. He can't tell us anything. I'm a talker. It's part of being the part of the human race. But it's really also genetic. It's yeah, I'm a price. My wife laughs because she knows my dad and my grandma and my sister. Oh, we got it bad. Talkers usually aren't <laughs> listeners. Sometimes I stop. And they just say, you know what, I need to listen. You know that if I've got something good to say and I have my life experience, probably somebody else does too. And maybe I could get something if I listened. All the time, <laughs> I'm always trying to fix stuff. And I, I, every now and again, I get uh, fortunate enough to meet somebody who's a pro at something that I'm interested in. And so I go tell them everything I know about it. 
instead of going and saying, I don't know as much as I'd like to about this. Could you tell me some things? Life. Stress. Circumstances. Who's the pro? Who's the expert? I don't, I'm not trying to be blasphemous or trite or anything like that, but who knows more? God or you? Wait. And you know, I think if you were to just average out David's calendar, it'd stress you out. You say, David, you're never going to get to be king. What are you doing out in the field playing with your stupid harp? What in the world? Like, did you, kings don't play harps and piddle with sheep. God was preparing his heart. David, you know what? You didn't do anything wrong, and you shouldn't be living in a cave. Matter of fact, the entire nation of Israel and Judah are divided and they've got their issues, and you can provide them the leadership that they needed, and people's lives are being messed up by Saul, and somebody ought to do something. Why don't you? David said, God didn't tell me to. Was he afraid? Do you lack courage? Now, you'd never say that about David, would you? David knew God wasn't afraid of anything, so he wasn't either. So if you've got a sage old man who died at a ripe age, having accomplished more than just about anybody ever has in their life, and you said, hey, could you give me just a piece? Could you give me a couple words? Here it is. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. That's pretty much it. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Father, I pray that you would impress us with this truth enough that we would exercise what we've learned from the Scripture this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for your attention tonight. You're dismissed. It's cold up here. I know it is. I usually have my jacket. <laughs> Did you make it okay? Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just right? It's freezing. 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 It's freezing